Oncology is a fascinating science. She formed this unique department at MD Anderson uh, called the Drug Development Department or the Department of Investigational Cancer Therapeutics, uh, treating patients independent of histology in clinical trials, who inspired me and focused my thought process toward drug development and carrier in clinical trials. And there was an explosion of genomically targeted therapies and immunotherapy options that was coming to the pipeline. Research should be standard of care and standard of care should be research. Good day, everyone, and uh, welcome to this episode of uh, Onco Influencers. I am Ravi Kara, VP of Oncology at Advanced Clinical, a clinical research services organization headquartered in Chicago. I'm also an editor with Onco Daily. We are very excited to have Dr. Vivek Subaya as our guest today. Dr. Subaya is currently the Chief of Early Phase Drug Development at uh, Sarah Cannon Research Institute, Nashville, Tennessee. He obtained his uh, MD from India. He completed two clinical fellowships, one in pediatric hematology and oncology, and another in adult oncology at uh, MD Anderson Cancer Center. He worked several years at uh, MD Anderson Cancer Center, rising to become the executive director of uh, oncology research before moving to his current position. He is a prolific investigator, having conducted over 100 phase one and two trials as uh, the principal investigator and over 200 clinical trials as a co-investigator. He's an expert in uh, tumor agnostic precision oncology and has been at the forefront of uh, practice changing BRAF and red tissue agnostic studies that led to approval by FDA, European Medicines Agency and other agencies across the world. We are very thrilled to have you. Thank you for your time. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Ravi Kara, for the generous introduction. It's a pleasure and honor to meet you and uh, thank you. Please, can you tell our viewers about your uh, early years, where you were born and raised? Uh, thank you so much for that question. So I was born and raised in the uh, southern Indian city of Chennai. It used to be called Madras before. It, it was one of the major metropolitan cities in India. And my dad was in banking. He moved to so many places, including Indonesia. But my parents made sure that my sister and I had continuous education. So we stayed in the same place in Chennai. And I, uh, I, I went from kindergarten to 12th grade in the same school in Chennai, attended medical school in Chennai as well. Again, uh, Ravi, you and I are from Chennai. Chennai, the world may not know, but it's a beautiful beach town. I right? home to the world's second longest beach called Marina Beach and has a unique culture uh, in a modern city. And early, early on, my mom, you know, mom uh, had a master's in education and a master's in economics, and she motivated me to be a public speaker, inspired me to read a lot uh, right from my you know, first, second grade, write a lot at the time. My parents really influenced my upbringing and helped me develop an independent thinking process. And that process that served me through school uh, and into my career. And my uh, there were no doctors in my you know, family. Uh, my um, dad was a professor and agricultural scientist, and then he moved into banking after getting an MBA. Um, I was inspired mainly uh, to, to think, you know, again, about the world, to think about service, you know, inspired by my grandfather. Because my grandfather was an academic, a renowned scholar. He studied at Oxford, traveled widely, wrote more than 120 books. So he was instrumental in making me think about scholarly work, scholarly activity, service, and need to contribute to society. I used to spend a lot of time, especially the holidays, with him walking on the Chennai Marina Beach. You know, he would talk about fascinating things uh, that had been a part of his scholarly work around the world, from world history, English literature, again, made me read Shakespeare, Milton, and almost all Greek literature. So again, you know that our you know, Marina Beach is studded with statues of world-famous personality scholars. So I read about all these scholars, read about all these personalities, 
it was inspiring to learn firsthand from many people you know who were uh there in 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 that area and it inspiring to talk to my grandfather he was well connected person he knew several great personalities and uh you know he helped again most importantly he helped thousands of people with their careers getting them education getting them jobs uh helping them with their lives and i thought to myself like at around 8th or 9th grade again i can probably help people with their jobs or career like my grandfather but it would be better again for me to save lives what what else i can do better right again i can give a uh, livelihood and jobs but saving lives i thought would be the next uh you know service to society again that uh, started my thought process uh and then i you know again in india you can go from high school to medical school directly so that started the thinking process for me to go to medical school so once i finished my medical school in india i moved to the united states i completed a, a combined uh, residency in both internal medicine and pediatrics uh, but both certified in both in uh, cleveland ohio and again i met several mentors at case western and cleveland clinic and national cancer institute where i did some rotation there in nih who inspired me to focus on oncology oncology is a fascinating science uh, driven specialty that combines the research opportunities with clinical care of our most vulnerable patients and combined all of the specialties that i was really interested in because i was really interested in endocrinology infectious diseases and oncology had uh, everything right research clinical care endocrinology infectious diseases thought process thinking in a service to patients it's an evolving nascent discipline and with my interest uh, you know turn to clinical trials i thought i could truly 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 make a difference here and needless to say today i think it was the best decision i made to move into oncology and oncology research so since then on um you know post residency i moved i i was able to get a fellowship at md anderson um i did a combined again uh, a unique uh, uh you know a fellowship with in combined a uh, pediatric hemonc and medical oncology again there was no set combined uh, fellowship but a but a in a unique place like md anderson can make it happen right so again i did a you know fellowship in pediatric hemonc and a medical oncology and i met several people there who inspired me to where i am right now three people i think i would i should say at md anderson during my formative years dr emil freireich who who everyone knows is the godfather of uh, oncology clinical trials and dr rasel kazrak who is a world renowned leader in drug development and dr pete anderson you know who was a compassionate physician who specialized in medicine and pediatrics a sarcoma physician so it was so nice to have these early influences in my career uh and again to think about something unique something novel Excellent. so again that led to where i was in terms of uh my faculty at md anderson and then it continued on it was a special privilege to be there uh and i led uh, uh you know i i started there at md anderson as faculty so again uh, i think that that should be enough for my early life until i became faculty please uh, ask further questions from from excellent. now on excellent excellent thanks that seems like a very brilliant journey now uh what drove you towards clinical trials initially again i i i would say my mentors right again dr freireich and his mentee dr kazrak had a major influence on my career she formed this unique department at md anderson uh, called the drug development department or the department of investigational cancer therapeutics uh, treating patients independent of histology in clinical trials and you know talking to uh, you know freireich dr kazrak dr pete anderson and several others i'm like i should focus on a career in drug development and clinical trials again new drugs novel drugs uh so that we can contribute for the you know next generation of research uh, dr freireich i got to really know him well because uh i was the ch chief administrative fellow 
running the graduate educational lecture series when he was a chair. He, he'd invite famous speakers uh, and on who's who in oncology. I used to interact with them behind their scenes, Nobel laureates, uh, you know, before their talks to introduce them. Uh, Freireich was uh, sort of a grandfather figure to me who inspired me and focused my thought process toward drug development and career in clinical trials. And later, after like seven or eight years, I became the chair of the, the same graduate medical education committee that Dr. Freireich was chairing, and it was a special privilege. And again, uh, you know, we used to discuss and bounce off a lot of ideas together. And since then, uh, once I became faculty, it was an exciting time when genomic sequencing entered clinic. And there was an explosion of genomically targeted therapies and immunotherapy options that was coming to the pipeline. And I was drawn to the concept of doing something different to benefit our patients rather than offering the same standard of care chemotherapeutic agents developed even before I was born. So again, since then, I've designed and led several first in human clinical trials, many precision oncology studies, starting with one of the first ever basket studies to be published in the New England Journal of Medicine. That led to the FDA approval of uh, BRAF inhibitors in Erdheim Chester disease and a rare disease called and Langerhansel histiocytosis. Since then, we designed a, a basket study called the Road Basket Study, Rare Oncology Agnostic Research. Uh, that led to the approval of Dabrafenib and Trematinib for anaplastic thyroid cancer. Again, that was one of the most lethal cancers known to us. And, you know, with a data set of 26 patients, we were able to get a drug approval. Again, subsequently, the same trial and same combination led to the first ever tissue agnostic approval in BRAF 600 positive tumors. Since then, I also led the RET inhibitor clinical trial uh, right from the first uh, human patient enrolled uh, in the universe, I would say, led the FDA approval for both the selective RET inhibitor studies, selpercatinib, and uh, pralcetinib for lung cancer, thyroid cancer, medullary thyroid cancer, and a tissue agnostic approval for a selpercatinib as well. Again, as you mentioned, uh, you know, Prince PI and designed uh, several studies, PI over 100 studies, and let several practice changing studies like uh, lurbinectidine for small cell lung cancer, pemigatinib for FGFR altered cancers. One of the you know, main things Dr. Freireich used to say that we can conduct all kinds of studies. Many people do clinical trials for the sake of clinical trials, but we need to answer the right questions so that what we do in terms of clinical trial research benefits patients and is impactful in the real world. How can we move the real uh, in the real world? The late Dr. Norman Jeffrey used to say that randomized studies might get you a high impact uh, paper and may push you in career. That's about it. It's just for your personal agenda, randomized control trials, but they are not really going to help that patients, especially you know, doing placebo controlled studies, especially in those arms receiving placebo. These quotes you know, still are really stuck in my head and inspired me to design studies, precision oncology studies uh, that can really help patients and pushing the needle forward. And now my Again, after leading all these um, FDA-approved uh, you know, therapies that can impact patients in the U.S., you know, again, I started working with all these companies to get these drugs approved, not just in the U.S., but across the world. But once the, one, the, the beginning is in the U.S., and then we need to get it approved across Europe. And you know, my thought is towards global harmonization. We need to make sure that we need to think locally and act globally. So again, I do a lot of work, uh, you know, helping seeing how we can improve access by getting approvals of these drugs globally. Excellent, excellent. Thanks a lot for that. Uh, I quote you, research should be standard of care and standard of care should be research. Please elaborate this for our viewers. Again, thank you so much. So the thing is that right now, on an average, less than 5%, again, the literature may go back and forth, less than 5% of patients with cancer are enrolled in cancer treatment clinical trials. The quintessential paradigm of you know, practice change for a disease 
is learned from the world of pediatric oncology, right? You know, you know that pediatric uh, pre B cell ALL was once a deadly disease, and it all started with treating patients on combination studies from Dr. Freireich's time. Dr. Freireich designed the first ever study with combination agents, right? Eventually, over time, you know, in the 70s, 80s, every pediatric patient was enrolled on a clinical trial nationwide. So almost 80 to 90% of patients were enrolled in clinical trials that moved the needle. The whole village, the whole pediatric oncology community got together to move the needle for cancer. Right now in 2024, you know, almost 96 to 97% of the patients with leukemia, pediatric leukemia cured. How did this ha happen? It didn't happen by fluke. It was a conscious decision by every doctor, every parent in that generation for, to volunteer for clinical research. The whole community got together to move the needle forward. So there was incremental studies being done and today we have that result. So with less than 5% of patients being enrolled in cancer clinical trials, how are we going to meet the you know, cancer needle in medical oncology? I think we can all do better. I think the whole, we need to have a all hands on deck, all stakeholder approach for moving the needle for cancer treatment clinical trials. The only way is standard of care should be research, and research should be standard of care. Again, we think about standard of care and research as two different silos. Again, before the COVID pandemic, the lay person, the lay people did not understand what clinical trials are. Every day, you know, they were showcasing in all the you know, news outlets about clinical trial, the clinical trial data being presented from the COVID clinical trial. So the lay public know what clinical trials are. So they understand the value of clinical trials. So I think right now is a time that even if we can increase the enrollment of patients with cancer from say five to 10% or 15%, you know, we will be closer to our goal of curing cancer. Again, someone said, cancer is not one disease, right? It's hundreds and thousands of diseases. Even if you think about lung cancer, it's thousands of diseases. Colorectal cancer is thousands of diseases. Someone calculated that it's going to take 1,200 years to cure cancer by this pace, you know, the same pace if you are going to do research and trials. So, I envision a future where, you know, we can assault, you know, cancer in the early, early, early disease course. And that can happen only with, if everyone comes together, right? When standard of care becomes research and research should be viewed as standard of care. Not just the oncologists, right? You need the whole healthcare team, patients, the caregivers, patient advocates, uh, academic institutions, community centers, community hospitals, uh, industry. Industry makes the drugs. You know, CROs, contract research organizations, like everyone needs to come together, right? All stakeholders, the government, the FDA, all the regulatory bodies, the HTA bodies in Europe and others. Everyone needs to get together with an all-hands-on-deck approach to move the cancer needle. People may think this is impossible, but let me tell you, during the COVID pandemic, with all hands on deck approach and a program like Operation Warp Speed, this was possible. When a virus in an unprecedented global pandemic, you know, post risk to the lives of humans, everyone got together. Within nine months of a pandemic, global pandemic, a vaccine, a drug was discovered, the virus genome was you know, unraveled, a vaccine was discovered, phase one, two, tri three trials were done in nine months and we were able to get the vaccine in nine months with an all hands on deck approach. 
I think this is unprecedented. So I think, you know, firstly, I think that cancer should be viewed as a public health emergency, just like COVID-19. You know, we all remember that time in the initial time of the pandemic that every news media outlet used to show in the screen the number of COVID cases, the number of deaths. And public got to know that it was a deadly disease. I think we should start putting that for cancer. Patients are dying. Millions of patients are dying every year with cancer. Cancer is a public emergency. Unless we have an all-hands-on-deck approach, just like COVID, it's going to take the same 1,200 years to cure cancer. Thanks for that. Uh, fully, fully agree with you that uh, research should be the standard of care. And again, going back to the 5% of the population, uh, of patient population that's participating to the clinical trials, just doubling that from 5 to 10, I think it's going to make a huge impact. Yes. Now, historically, what have been the biggest challenges that you have uh, encountered when uh, enrolling patients into first in human clinical trials? And again, the challenge is, you know, first, the first step is referrals, right? Referral, re referring patients to, you know, uh, clinical trials. So that, that itself should start right from the first line therapy, right? Again, clinical trials are viewed as last line option in most patients. It should be viewed differently. Right now we have genomically targeted therapies, immunotherapeutics, antibody drug conjugates and beyond. I think all these drugs will work earlier and earlier in the disease course, right? In oncology training, uh, we need to, you know, uh, and, and shine upon the young oncologists and the future oncologists that they should start thinking about clinical trials right from the first line of therapy, right? NCCN guidelines say that the best uh, treatment or best care of patients uh, is always in a clinical trial, consider clinical trials. But, you know, to be honest, real world, there are no pathways for clinical trial reference, right? So again, it should be enshrined in the, the workforce, the onco you know, first, our workforce should be oncogenomic savvy, right? 80% of the workforce is not oncogenomic savvy. So we need to make sure that the workforce is oncogenomic savvy. Uh, workforce is clinical trial savvy. I think we need to have basic education of clinical trials for all oncologists and all healthcare team members so that they can think about clinical trials right from the get-go, right? Number one. Number two is uh, access to clinical trials, right? Clinical trials, at least in the U.S., are uh, relegated to niche boutique centers, academic centers. So again, most of the patients, vulnerable patients with cancer, uh, have to travel long distances to seek clinical trials. So one of the reasons why, personally, I, I moved to an institution uh, like Sarah Cannon, as you know, is one of the world's leading oncology research organizations conducting clinical trials, and you know, SCRI uh, recently, a year ago, year and a half ago, uh, they had a joint venture with uh, U.S. Oncology Research, and uh, you know they are they are developing programs across an organization, uh, a research network of more than thousand three hundred physicians um, in more than two fifty locations in twenty four states, so that. Again, this you know, gives us an opportunity to see how we can move and provide access to clinical trials to where patients are, not vice versa. You know, we all think about day-to-day, uh, -day, think about ordering something in Amazon Prime, right? We are thinking about something like Amazon Prime, right? Amazon Prime is everything comes to you. Right now, the patients have to go to clinical trials. I envision a future where clinical trials come to patients, right? I think that's that's a bottleneck, right? We don't, patients, number one is, uh, workforce is not adept in clinical trials. They are not oncogenically savvy. Number two is, uh, there is no access to clinical trials. First, access to clinical trials. Even if there are clinical trials, they are only in niche centers. So there are many clinical trial deserts across, even in the US. If that is the state of affairs in the US, one of the most developed, countries for clinical trial research, think about the rest of the world, think about Latin America, think about Africa, think about India, think about uh, many other countries. 
right, that do not have access to these novel therapies. Many times, access to novel therapies is only through clinical trials, cutting edge clinical trials. So that's that access to clinical trials. And then uh, granularly, the eligibility criteria. Uh, eligibility criteria are so designed in such a way that you know only the fittest patients can get on clinical trials. We need to be pragmatic. We need to be really pragmatic in when we, uh, especially a, a patient with cancer is enrolled on a clinical trial to see how it can mirror the real world. And you know there are several initiatives by um, uh, the FDA, EMA, and ASCO, ESMO to see how the clinical trial ecosystem can design studies in a pragmatic way. So that you know, clinical trials do represent a real world and real uh, life patients. I think those are the three major bottlenecks in the in a, in a challenges in in clinical trials enterprise. Excellent, thanks a lot. I think these are the three that uh, we have also encountered as my role in uh, running uh, clinical trials across the globe. I think. Uh, not just uh, in any particular country, but most often, no. these are the three recurring problems across the board, across the globe. Now, what drives you to do what you do every day? I think that's a great question. I think um, to, again, we are all, you know, temporary individuals in the world. If you think about that, if you think about the, the vast span of time, we are a dot, less than a dot in the universe, temporary people. Again, in that this temporary time, we can need to think beyond what we can do for ourselves and our family. Think about how we can contribute to something and see how we can contribute even in a small way. Right? If I'm not asking everyone to be Mahatma Gandhi, Mother Teresa, or Martin Luther King, right? But everyone, each and every individual can contribute in their own way. And the pathway that has led me here is I've been trained in clinical trials and clinical trial research in one of the major academic centers, number one cancer center in the US, if not the world, if not the universe. How can I myself with my knowledge of the clinical trial uh, contribute to the society, right? In the community. Again, how can I marry that? How can I marry all that knowledge? How can I take the knowledge to impact patients at a larger scale in an unprecedented way? So I think to myself, if not me, who? If not, now when? So that's what drives me to do what I do. Again, beyond the US, again, thinking about talking to so many of our uh, colleagues across the world, seeing how we can harmonize uh, clinical uh, you know, trials and drug access of these new uh, medicines across the globe. I think that's another thing I work on is that. And I think it, this is the best time to be in oncology. Right? Again, we have uh, unprecedented advances in, in oncology. 20 years ago, they said we cannot sequence a human genome. We took $3 billion to sequence the first genome. Right now, we can get it done for $1,000 in the US. Uh, colleagues in India, China, Singapore, they say that they can get it down to $1 in the next decade. Right, So any human being can be sequenced. That's number one. And then we have drugs to go after that. We have immunotherapeutics to go after that. We have so many, so many different drugs. And I think we can use all this knowledge to, to move the field and advance uh, the field forward. Uh, so again, uh, this is the best of times to be working as an oncology drug developer. And again, contribute in even in a point oh, 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 one way in advancing uh, care for patients with cancer. I think that, you know, I, I can sleep better if I know that I contributed that. Excellent. That was really brilliant. Uh, it was not only philosophical, but it also based on what really happened with uh, the facts, for example, the uh, human genome project and so on. So that was wonderful. Thanks a lot for your time. And uh, it was very, very nice to meet and talk with you and uh, get to know you. Thanks a lot. 
Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Ravi Kera. Again, it was a pleasure and honor. Don't forget to like, comment, share, and subscribe to Anka Daily on YouTube. Hit the bell icon to stay updated.